Uh, today, we welcome back the Obama administration's top officials for closing the detention center at Guantanamo Bay. In March, these two gentlemen appeared before the committee to discuss the administration's proposal to relocate the prison and its detainees to the continental United States, as well as the process of releasing individuals to foreign countries. Much of the news from that hearing surrounded Mr. Lewis's revelation that, in his words, unfortunately there have been Americans that have died because of Guantanamo detainees. And indeed, last month, the Washington Post reported that the administration believes that at least 12 detainees released from the Guantanamo facility have since attacked U.S. or allied forces in Afghanistan, killing about a half dozen Americans. That was startling, startling enough. But it is particularly disturbing that upon close examination, these witnesses made statements to the committee that are inconsistent with the documents and inconsistent with information that the administration has supplied the committee under the law. Specifically, the committee asked, whether the Department of Defense ever knowingly transferred a detainee to a country that did not exhibit an ability to substantially mitigate the risk of recidivism or maintain custody or control of that individual. Mr. Lewis and Mr. Wolowski assured committee members that it had not. Yet numerous intelligence reports provided by the administration suggest that their answers were inaccurate. In fact, the Defense Department had done so on numerous occasions. The Secretary of State has the sole responsibility to negotiate transfers, including agreements to monitor release detainees. Under the law, Congress regularly receives information from the intelligence community on the return to terrorism rate of individuals released to foreign countries, as well as assessments of a country's ability to prevent terrorists from returning to the fight. Simply put, many countries just aren't up to the job. And a diplomatic agreement to do the job isn't worth the paper it is written on if a country does not have the resources, does not have the training, to keep committed terrorists from returning to the battlefield. Yet, the administration has sent Guantanamo terrorists to these countries anyway. To then deceive this committee and the American people is deeply disturbing. And when given the opportunity to correct the record for the committee, they ignored us. I appreciate that the administration finally responded on Tuesday, but it shouldn't take the calling of a hearing to elicit a return letter, especially on something as consequential as this. This committee has an obligation to conduct oversight. While we have differences of opinion over Guantanamo policy, I don't think anyone here finds the administration's dismissiveness acceptable. And should anyone think the committee's concerns are theoretical, and specifically I was pressing on these terrorists who had transferred, been transferred to Uruguay, it is not theoretical because now Jihad Diab, who's an Al-Qaeda-linked terrorist, who was sent from Guantanamo to Uruguay in December 2014, we sounded the alarm about Uruguay's lack of legal framework. We explained to you about the critical resources to prevent travel outside the country, that that was lacking in the case of Uruguay. And so what is the result? The result is last month, Jihad Diab disappeared from Uruguay. His current whereabouts are unknown. And this was after Mr. Wolowski testified to us in March that we are confident that the government of, of Uruguay is taking appropriate steps to substantially mitigate the risk of this former detainee and others sent to Uruguay. 
Yesterday, CNN, citing U.S. officials, reported that this terrorist was last spotted in Venezuela. He is believed to be headed back to Syria or Yemen. We have been awaiting answers to the committee's inquiry. But while I've been patient, the President has been in a rush, seemingly willing to release Guantanamo terrorists to wherever he can. I wish we were not here today. Holding another Guantanamo hearing this week was not my intention. But he is loose, and my patience has run out. And I now turn to the ranking member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Wolowski and Mr. Lewis. Welcome back, and, and thank you for your service. Uh, last time you gentlemen were here, I made my views on the Guantanamo prison pretty clear, and I would ask that my opening statement from that hearing be included as part of the record of this hearing. To, re to recap, uh, the prison should be closed. National security experts of both parties agree with me. In fact, I have a letter here from 36 retired generals and admirals calling for the prison's closure, and I ask that it be included in the record. The prison is a waste of money and a propaganda tool for terrorists. That's end of story as far as the prison goes. There were, however, some issues raised about transferred detainees at the last hearing that deserve some follow-up, and I say transferred rather than released because there's an extensive process that goes into removing a detainee from the prison and sending him to another country. It's not as though they're just set loose. But it is important to know how exactly are we monitoring transfer detainees and assessing the risk they pose. Those are good questions. But because they deal with intelligence methods, we can only discuss them in a closed, classified setting. My understanding is that the administration offered to do just that, and that offer was rebuffed. I, I, I hope that after this hearing, in, in a few weeks or so, we can have a closed classified setting to get answers to some questions that you are not uh, really allowed to say here in open session. So why are we here? The title of today's hearing is Demanding Accountability, the Administration's Reckless Release of Terrorists from Guantanamo. Well, since we say reckless release, it, it sounds like people's minds are made up. And I want to make sure all the facts are on the table, because I think there's plenty of blame to go all around. I think the chairman raises legitimate issues, but I do think there's plenty of blame to go around. First, the vast majority of Guantanamo detainees were transferred out of the prison before President Obama took office. A total of 780 detainees have been held in Guantanamo. During the Bush administration, 500 were transferred out, compared to 159 detainees under President Obama. Secondly, let's look at the number of transfer detainees who return to the battlefield. The figure 30 percent gets thrown around a lot, but what goes into that number? It turns out it includes the total number of transfer detainees that we know for sure have returned to the fight, as well as those suspected of reengagement over the entire life of the Guantanamo prison 2001 to, pr to present. During the Bush years 2001 through 2008, the rate of suspected and confirmed cases of reengagement was actually higher than that, 35 percent, with 21 percent of the cases confirmed and 14 percent suspected. So let me say that again. More than one-third of the terrorists that President Bush's administration transferred may have returned to the fight. Now let's contrast that with the Obama administration. Under President Obama, that number, again, totaling suspected and confirmed cases, drops to 13 percent, 8 percent suspected, and just 5 percent confirmed. That 5 percent represents seven people. Now, I know one person escaping is, is one person too much, but I just want to uh, have a, a balanced hearing here, because if we've already made up our minds in talking about the administration being reckless, um, it doesn't seem to me like we're really here to learn anything more. Uh, I, I, uh, I re reiterate, as most 13 percent of those transfers since January 2009 have reengaged, compared to as much as 35 percent during the previous administration. Um, the contrast is, is striking. But let's not get lost in the numbers, because this is perhaps the most important point. The transferred detainees who returned to the battlefield and killed Americans 
were let out during the Bush administration, not during the Obama administration. So if we're going to paint with a broad brush and say 30 percent of transfer detainees may be going back to the fight and killing Americans, we need to take the whole story and put it in perspective. Uh, the Bush administration racked up that average and then some. The Obama administration has helped to bring it back down. Thirdly, the administration's closure plan would not transfer any person who does not meet the most stringent criteria. I've heard claims that the remaining detainees are the worst of the worst and the administration simply wants to turn them loose. That's false. T 29 of 79 remaining detainees are cleared for transfer. Among them are 22 Yemenis. The administration isn't transferring them yet. As a matter of policy, we transfer detainees to their home countries. But in the case of Yemen, the government cannot provide adequate security assurances. So the administration has pumped the brakes out of an abundance of caution. We need to find countries that can provide adequate assurances before those 22 are transferred. That leaves 50. Some of these are really bad guys. Ten of them will stand trial. Another 40 are being legitimately held as prisoners of war. But under no circumstances, in my opinion, is the Obama administration simply opening the gate and releasing dangerous terrorists onto the street. Look, Guantanamo is a mess, and it always has been. No one is blameless. Anyone can cherry pick single cases to paint a picture, big or small, good or bad. But I think the facts and the statistics speak for themselves. Um, and I think that what we should do a a after this, instead of having the witnesses come and, and tell us that they can only tell us things in a classified briefing, is to spend our time with them after this hearing in a few weeks, uh, where we could be in a closed sitting, uh, setting, getting to the bottom of this matter. Um, now, the Foreign Affairs Committee obviously has oversight on this issue. The hearing last March and today's hearing are the only two times that the committee has taken up this issue in the nearly 15 years that Guantanamo Prison has been open. So since we have our top Guantanamo experts with us today, I hope you can give us your opinions on some interesting ideas we've recently heard about that prison. I'm going to read you a few quotes. You may recognize them. I'll give you a hint. It's one of the candidates running for president. Here's the first, quote, this morning I watched President Obama talking about Gitmo, Guantanamo Bay, which by the way we are keeping open, and we're going to load it up with some bad dudes. We're going to load it up, unquote. And the second, quote, torture works, okay, folks? Believe me, it works. And waterboarding is your minor form. Some people say it's not actually torture. Let's assume it is. But they ask me the question, what do you think of waterboarding? Absolutely fine, but we should go much stronger than waterboarding. We should go much stronger because our country's in trouble, unquote. So I, I just want to say that I, I, I read that because um, you know, it's, it's, it, some people say they want to expand the Guantanamo prison and torture. I can't think of a worse proposal for our national security. Um, these schemes would only harm us with our allies and provide ammunition to our adversaries. Mr. Wolski, Mr. Lewis, at some point today, maybe we can hear your views on what would happen if we went in that direction. Again, I, I, I hate doing tit for tats, but I, I do think it's, it's not uh, really fair to uh, blame the administration for uh, all the frustrations we have about Guantanamo uh, when we see that there were uh, problems and, and uh, wrong things done in, in, pre in the previous administration as well. So I look forward to listening to you and hearing your thoughts. And um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Engel. This morning, we are pleased to be joined by Special Envoy Lee Wolowski. Uh, Special Envoy for Guantanamo Closure at the U.S. Department of State. Previously, Mr. Wolowski served as the Director for Transnational Threats on the National Security Council under President Clinton. And uh, Mr. Paul Lewis is joining us. Uh, we're pleased that uh, he's here, Special Envoy for Guantanamo Detention Closure at the U.S. Department of Defense. Previously, Mr. Lewis served as both the General Counsel and the Minority General Counsel on the U.S. Armed Services Committee. Without objection, the, com the witnesses' full prepared statements will be made part of the record. Members will have five calendar days to submit 
any statements or questions or any extraneous material they might want to submit for the record. And I'd like to remind everyone, including our witnesses, that willful misrepresentation of or false statements by a witness as a criminal offense under 18 U.S. Code Section 1001. Indeed, that is the case for all of our hearings. And Special Envoy Wolowski, please summarize your remarks. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Engel, distinguished members of the committee, good morning. I appreciate your inviting me once again to appear before this committee. I look forward to continuing our discussion in closed session, either later today, as we have offered, or as soon as possible, so that we can have a fuller discussion of some of the classified topics we know are of interest to the committee. Altogether, a total of 779 detainees have passed through Guantanamo, and of those, 700 have departed. The vast majority of detainees transferred out of Guantanamo to other countries, some 532, were transferred by the administration of George W. Bush. Under President Obama, a total of 159 detainees have been transferred. Today, 79 remain. President Bush acted to whittle the detainee population because he understood that, and I quote, the detention facility had become a propaganda tool for our enemies and a distraction for our allies, close quote. President Obama has continued detainee transfers for many of the same reasons. Of the 79 detainees detained at Guantanamo today, 29 are currently approved for transfer. Detainees have been designated as approved for transfer during this administration through one of two rigorous interagencies, interagency processes. First, soon after taking office, President Obama ordered the first ever comprehensive interagency review of all of the 242 detainees then in U.S. custody. In 2009 and 2010, the Guantanamo Review Task Force, sometimes also called the Executive Order Task Force, which was comprised of more than 60 national security professionals from across the government, assembled all reasonably available information relevant to determining an appropriate disposition for each detainee. Then, based on the task force's recommendations, the Departments of Defense, State, Justice, and Homeland Security, the Office of the Director for National Intelligence, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff unanimously determined the appropriate disposition for each detainee, transfer, referral for prosecution, or continued law of war detention. Second, pursuant to Executive Order 13567, detainees who were not, who were not approved for transfer in 2009 and 2010 could be subject to additional review by the Periodic Review Board. The PRB is comprised of senior representatives from six agencies and depart departments. None of the PRB representatives are political appointees. Having described how Guantanamo detainees have been approved for transfer, I would now like to briefly describe the process for transferring detainees. Decisions regarding whether, when, and where to transfer a detainee are the culmination of another rigorous interagency process. The Department of State leads diplomatic negotiations with foreign governments regarding the transfer of Guantanamo detainees, but we are typically joined in our discussions by senior career officials from the Departments of Defense, Justice, and Homeland Security, as well as those in the intelligence community and on the Joint Staff. Generally, transfer, negoti transfer negotiations occur in two steps. First, the U.S. government obtains or reconfirms a political commitment that the potential receiving country is willing, in principle, to resettle or repatriate detainees and to impose various measures that will substantially mitigate the threat that detainees may pose after transfer. Second, we engage in technical discussions with foreign officials responsible for implementing these measures. These technical discussions offer the opportunity to tailor the integration and security measures to specific circumstances under consideration, to share best practices from previous detainee transfers, and perhaps most importantly, to determine, based on an individualized assessment of these specific circumstances, whether the statutory standard in the NDAA governing the foreign transfer of Guantanamo detainees can be met. Once we conclude that our diplomatic negotiations will result 
and a security framework that we assess will substantially mitigate the threat a detainee may pose after transfer. The Secretary of Defense consults with the Secretaries of State, Homeland Security, and the Attorney General, the Director of National Intelligence, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff on the transfer. Only after the Secretary of Defense receives the views of those principals, and only if he is satisfied that the requirements of the NDAA are satisfied, does the Secretary of Defense sign and transmit a certification to the Congress conveying his intention to transfer detainees. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, let me close by saying that although we would obviously prefer that no former detainees engage in terrorist or insurgent activity following their transfer, we believe that the low rate of confirmed re-engagement for detainees transferred since January 2009, under 5%, is testament to the rigorous interagency approach the administration has taken to both approving detainees for transfer and to negotiating and vetting detainee transfer frameworks. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Lewis. Chairman Royce, Ranking Member Engel, distinguished members of the committee, Representative Donovan, thank you for the opportunity to testify again regarding the, the administration's Guantanamo detainee transfer process. Secretary Carter has approved the transfer of 43 detainees, 28 of whom have been transferred this year. Secretary Hagel approved the transfer of 44 detainees. Secretary Panetta, seven, and Secretary Gates, 65. During this administration, 159 detainees have been transferred. Mr. Chairman, we understand the importance of this issue to you and this committee, and we appreciate the attention you have given to it. As I stated in March at the outset, I'd like to reiterate one continuing fundamental point regarding this detention facility. The President and his National Security Committee have determined that closing this detention facility is a national security imperative. Imperative is a strong term. The President and his leadership of of the national security team believe that the continued operation of detention facility weakens our national security. Closing Guantanamo is about protecting the country, not weakening it. As you know, the importance in closing this detention facility is echoed by former President George W. Bush and a long list of former secretaries of state, secretaries of defense, joint staff chairmen, and other former military leaders. As Representative Engel noted, um, a letter was provided to the committee by former um, flag officers, including a former commandant of the Marine Corps. Transfers from Gitmo are in the national security interest of the United States and are conducted in a safe and responsible manner. On March 23, 2016, I testified before this committee. During that hearing, as the chairman noted, I was asked whether the Department of Defense had ever knowingly transferred a detainee to a country that that did not exhibit an ability to substantially mitigate the risk or control the individual. In response to that question, I stated the Department of Defense had not conducted such a transfer. I stand by my, by my response. We have addressed your concerns, Mr. Chairman, in the letter um, that we sent to you this week, and I again apologize for the late response, but I want to briefly highlight several points. Here's our statutory framework. The 2016 NDA requires that at least 30 days prior to any transfer, and in addition to other requirements, the Secretary of Defense certify to Congress that the receiving country has taken or agreed to take steps to substantially mitigate any risk the individual could attempt to re-engage or otherwise threaten the United States. We have met that statutory requirement with each of our transfers. Prior to the transfer of any detainee to a foreign country, the United States government receives security assurances from the receiving country regarding the actions that the receiving country has taken or agrees to take to substantially mitigate the risk. After the assurances are negotiated, the Secretary of Defense and his senior staff engage in a robust review process that considers many factors, including all of the intelligence that the government has regarding the threat posed by the individual detainee and the security assurances. Importantly, updated intelligence, medical, and compliance information is provided to each country regarding the detainees under consideration for the transfer. Many countries also take the opportunity to travel to Gitmo to interview transfer candidates. After full consideration of all this information, 
including a full and update assessment from the intelligence community, the Secretary makes the determination that I told you about earlier. As Secretary Carter has testified and Secretary Hagel testified, they take this responsibility very seriously. Secret Secretary Carter has said he will not transfer a detainee that he does not believe is in the security interest of the United States to do so. These transfers have not been conducted in a vacuum, sir. Each transfer is formally notified to Congress, and we regularly brief members and staff on transfers. With the notice of each transfer, we offer to brief congressional leadership and members and staff of all the national security committees. I appreciate the opportunity we have had to regularly brief you and your staff regarding these transfers. Briefly, I think it's important to put these recent transfer decisions in a foreign policy context for this committee. Many countries in the international community want to close Gitmo and have stepped up to help us. Specifically, over 30 countries since 2009 have accepted for resettlement Guantanamo, Guantanamo detainees that are not nationals of their country. Additionally, there is sustained support for our closure efforts from civil society organizations, both domestic and abroad, including the Organization for American States. Even the Vatican has expressed the support for our closure efforts. In summary, each transfer is only approved after careful scrutiny by the intensive interagency review process and the negotiation of the security assurances sufficient to, to substantially mitigate any threat. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to again recognize the military service members who conduct detention operations at Guantanamo. These men and women continue to have our deepest appreciation for their service and the professionalism they display each and every day on behalf of our nation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. The last time you, you appeared before this committee, we asked specific questions about the transfer of detainees to countries ill-equipped to handle them. Specifically, we asked whether the Department of Defense ever transferred a detainee to a country that it knew was incapable of maintaining control of that individual and keeping him from returning to the battlefield. Mr. Lewis responded no. Mr. Wolski stated that he was not aware of such an instance. Upon further review of your own intelligence assessments, those answers appear to be false. In fact, it appears that the administration has released dangerous terrorists to ill-equipped countries on numerous occasions. On May 16, I wrote to your departments asking you to correct the record. You, you did not. The committee asked the administration to halt all transfers until you explained your testimony. You did not. In fact, you completely ignored the letter until we called this hearing. And that is why we are here today. And I'm going to ask you several simple questions, and I'd appreciate a simple yes or no answer. Mr. Lewis, Mr. Walski, in your roles, do you have access to intelligence assessments of detainees and transfer countries? Yes. Yes. Do you review those intelligence assessments prior to the transfer of detainees to the custody of foreign governments? Yes, sir. We review the intelligence assessments that are material to the issue before us, which is whether to transfer a detainee to a specific country under certain circumstances in order to be able to meet the statutory standard. Right. And in my May 16th letter, I referenced three intelligence reports submitted to Congress pursuant to Section 1023 of the National Defense Authorization Act. Those reports are dated May 31st of 2013, July 15th of 2014, August 6th of 2015. Are you familiar with the content of those reports? Yes. Yes. Are you aware that those reports contains assessments of each country to which the Defense Department has transferred detainees? Yes. Yes. And are you aware that those assessments indicate that some countries lack the ability to control those terrorists? Now, we cannot, by law, discuss classified defense intelligence agency assessments in this session, Mr. Chairman. We're happy to do that uh, in closed session. Uh, what I would point out 
to the committee uh, is that in connection with each transfer, uh, we do rely on intelligence reporting that is broader than just DIA reporting. And as I said, is tailored specifically to the issue of a transfer to a certain country uh, at a particular point in time uh, and is geared toward a determination or an analysis of whether the relevant statutory standard for transfers can be met. Mr. Chairman, it, the reports you refer to are one of many reports we look at. We look at all source information from the intelligence community. And as the envoy has stated, the secretary makes his determination looking at all the evidence that's available, the updated evidence, and in particular, he makes his assessment after we overlay the security assurances to that country. So if the intelligence tells us that, tells us that there may be a gap in capabilities, that's what we negotiate the assurances for. So again, we look at those records, Mr. Chairman, yep. but we look at a much broader array of records. I'm, I'm going to explain to you, Mr. Lewis, that is, that is not what you said here in March, all right? And in light, in light of your familiarity with the intelligence reports and what is in those reports, I'm just going to ask you again, has the administration ever transferred a detainee to a country it knew? was incapable of monitoring that individual, preventing him from traveling outside the country or otherwise keeping him from returning to the battlefield. Sir, since I've worked for Secretary Hagel and Secretary Carter, every transfer has met the statutory requirement. And it's my understanding that the administration, prior to my coming, transferred pursuant to the process that um, Envoy Woloski um, indicated. And um, there are no transfers that I'm aware of that did not meet the um, statutory requirement. I, I don't think you can just wish away intelligence reports that raise grave concerns, reports that you chose to deny when asked about them in our last hearing. And, but if, if you're now saying that the intelligence reports uh, are, I assume the implication here, incomplete, um, then, um, then I have to say, from what we can tell, the president has made a political decision to close Guantanamo no matter what the cost to national security, based, based upon our experience, based upon our discussions, which go on for some considerable time now in terms of the warnings from us on this committee about the five individuals who were transferred to Uruguay and their subsequent conduct, and now the fact that um, one of them has been, been released. That can be the only reason why these intelligence assessments are being pushed aside, in my judgment. Um, and it, it appears that the assurances that you got from Uruguay didn't account for anything. This fellow, Jihad Diab, walked right out of Uruguay. We have no idea where he is. And if that country is telling you that they won't pre prevent their travel, which is what I pointed out to you, then we'd better listen. If they're not going to prevent their travel, then it's not a surprise what subsequently has occurred. So, Mr. Wolski, you've briefed this committee several times about it. Uruguay. You've told us repeatedly that the government of Uruguay was capable of handling these terrorists. In fact, you testified on March 23rd that we are confident, to your question, that the government of Uruguay is taking appropriate steps to substantially mitigate the risk associated with each of the six detainees that have been transferred to its custody. That turned out to be wrong, as I've pointed out. Jihad Diab has now escaped. Now, the other point I would make out, make, make to you, and this also goes to some of the conversations he's had, is that I'm aware this was the third time he left Uruguay. And nobody knows where he is. The media is reporting that he could be on his way to Syria or Yemen. And I, I would just like to ask, why did you provide false assurances to Congress? Why did you mislead us about Uruguay's capabilities? Because I made it very clear to you, our concerns about Uruguay's capabilities 
They're in, they were pretty upfront. Mr. Chairman, I strongly disagree with any suggestion that I misled this committee. In fact, I stand by my testimony from March in which I affirmed that Uruguay had committed to and is in fact taking steps to substantially mitigate the risk of the six detainees that were transferred to its custody in December 2014. Uh, while we would have preferred uh, that Mr. Diab remained in Uruguay, if in fact he is not in Uruguay currently, uh, until the expiration of the two-year resettlement program uh, that was the subject um, uh, of, of the agreement reached with Uruguay and reached with him, frankly. Uh, the fact is, is that um, uh, the standard is not um, elimination of risk, it is mitigation of risk. Uh, and there is no, we never represented to this committee that there was a travel prohibition. Uh, what the President's closure plan describes generally, and I cannot get into this form, uh, into the specific assurances provided by the Government of Uruguay, but what the President's plan describes are travel restrictions. Uh, the President's plan describes specifically the withholding of international travel documents. Now, there are a number of additional steps that we take and our partners take uh, to restrict travel and to monitor travel. Uh, I cannot go into those in an open session. I'm happy to describe them to you, uh, even in this specific context of Uruguay, in a closed session. Um, but I cannot do it here. But, but let me explain this simple fact to you. When a country tells you that they won't prevent a terrorist from traveling, then you had better listen if your intention is to release that terrorist into that country. But my, my time has expired. I will go to Mr. Elliot Engel of New York. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Lewis, let me, let me start with you. Um, in a hearing uh, before uh, this committee in March, uh, you discussed the issue of uh, former Guantanamo detainees killing Americans. Uh, according to White House Press Secretary Josh Earnest, none of the former detainees who have gone through a screening process implemented by this administration in 2009 have harmed Americans. To quote Mr. Ernest from March of this year, and I quote him, no one who's been released from prison at Guantanamo Bay on President Obama's watch has been implicated in violence against Americans, unquote. So I would like to ask both of you, how has the Obama administration changed the detainee transfer process from the process used before President Obama took office? Or has he not changed it? I understand it's been changed. How have these changes helped prevent former detainees from harming Americans. So why don't we start with you, Mr. Walowski. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Engel. Um, uh, 532 detainees uh, from Guantanamo were released under the administration of George W. Bush. Uh, the fact is that we can't tell you much uh, about the circumstances under which they were released. Uh, we can speak to what our administration uh, has done. Uh, and what we understand to have been the process in the previous administration. Uh, so first, uh, we engage in a rigorous interagency, evidence-based process, reliant predominantly on career government officials to determine first if a detainee may in principle be designated as approved for transfer and, and transferred out of the custody of the United States. That's the first step. This is an interagency process uh, that includes many uh, career professionals throughout the government. And as I described in my testimony, in this administration, there are actually two separate processes at various points in the administration to first determine whether, in principle, a detainee may be safely transferred subject to security assurances. Second thing we do very carefully uh, is we negotiate for detainees who have been approved for transfer specific security assurance packages consistent with local law in the places that we transfer these detainees to, uh, and after obtaining a political commitment uh, from the country in question, uh, uh, that under the circumstances in question, the measures to be put in place by the country, monitoring travel restrictions, 
information sharing, integration planning will mitigate substantially the risk that that particular detainee may pose. Um, that's what we do. Uh, and what we have done, uh, as I said in my opening statement, um, has reduced the reengagement rate um, the confirmed rate uh, to under 5 percent. It's much higher in the previous administration. We believe that that reflects the fact that the things that I just described simply weren't done in the previous administration. Um, uh, but that's what we have done. Thank yeah. you. Mr. Engel, it's a more rigorous process. Um, the process in the previous administration was only DOD, primarily only DOD, as um, Anvay Wolofsky has said, this is interagency. Um, when the Obama administration took office, there were about 240 detainees at Gitmo. We took a fresh look for over a year at all of those detainees and decided three categories, those that could be eligible for transfer with appropriate security assurances to the proper country, um, those that um, they wanted to refer for prosecution, to take a look at prosecution, and those that merited continued law of war detention. Um, I say it's more rigorous because, as Lee said, there was a broader group of career professionals um, and some politicals, but primarily career professionals, intelligence folks, career prosecutors who looked at these cases. They also looked at a broader array of evidence. They looked at all the evidence that the USG possessed, whereas the previous process was primarily DOD evidence. And then as we know Congress weighed in, we now have a statutory overlay for all transfers. So the, the bottom line is, as Lee said, it's a much more rigorous and intensive process. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to put it into context because, look, even one prisoner escaping is one prisoner too much. So we're not going to say that um, it, anything is foolproof. Nothing is foolproof. But I think that if we look and, and, and see what the administration has done um, and the safeguards they've tried to put in, um, I, I, I feel that um, – we're, we're do absolutely doing our best, and in fact, it's a big improvement in the previous administration. So let me ask you this. We've heard a lot about the challenges of closing, closing Guantanamo. Is it true, it is true, it is true that some former detainees have reengaged. I know Chairman is very uh, upset about it, and so am I. But can you help put those cases into context? Uh, what, what are the costs of keeping this facility open, and how would halting the transfer of clear detainees affect terrorist recruitment and propaganda and coalition efforts to degrade and defeat terrorist organizations? Sir, there are three costs. It's primarily, it drains our expenses. It's wildly, wildly expensive. We can do it cheaper in the United States. More importantly for this committee, our allies want us to close Gitmo. It hurts us with the international community. Uh, in my previous testimony, in my opening statement, I outlined indications in which members of the previous administration at the Department of State said Gitmo hurt us. And uh, I believe it is a propaganda and recruiting tool. Um, President Bush said that. Many others have said that. The bottom fundamental point is we want to protect the country. And the national security leadership of this administration President Bush and many people in his administration, numerous secretaries of defense, numerous secretaries of state, the prior military officials that we talked about, including a commandant of the Marine Corps, have said the cost of Gitmo outweighs the benefit. It hurts us. It hurts us with the international community. It hurts us with our taxpayer money, and it, it is a recruiting tool. Um, the president has made this decision, and the national security community leadership has made this decision. Lee? Um, sure, thank you. Uh, first, um, I agree with uh, Special Envoy's comments, uh, and I do feel compelled just to address this notion of terrorists escaping and prisoners escaping and things of that sort, just to remind the committee uh, that the individuals that we're talking about um, were held in law of war detention by the United States. They were lawfully held uh, under law of war detention, um, but they weren't convicted of crimes. Uh, when we transfer them to foreign countries, uh, we transfer them subject to uh, security assurances such as travel restrictions. Um, there are a large – this is what this administration does. The previous administration did not do this. There are a large number of detainees 
uh, of the 532 transferred in the previous administration, certainly, that weren't even subject to the travel restrictions that we put in place on these individuals. But again, just want to make sure that we're getting the terminology right because um, escaping uh, connotes uh, incarceration. When we transfer individuals who the U.S. government rich la writ large has concluded may be transferred subject to security assurances, um, they are transferred subject to those security assurances. Uh, uh, and at that point, they are, not, uh, they are not prisoners. They are former detainees uh, under supervision. Um, I'll, I'll um, stop now because I know my time is, has run out. But I wanted to, you know, the, the, the thing that, that irks the chairman and, fa frankly, irks, irks all of us is the fact that this uh, person was, was sent to Uruguay and uh, uh, Uruguay apparently uh, doesn't have the uh, ability to to monitor uh, this person who now has left the country. Um, just briefly, could you talk a little bit about the about the about the case, or or do you need to do it in a classified setting? On the issue of uh, uh, foreign countries. Um, surveillance capabilities, I would need to discuss that uh, with you uh, in closed session, and, and I welcome the opportunity to do so, so that you may be informed uh, about uh, what those capabilities are uh, and what they aren't, uh, and how they uh, were used and applied in this instance. I echo um, the envoy's comments. We would um, appreciate the opportunity to discuss this in detail. What I can tell you is we talk to the Uruguayan authorities on a regular basis. We regularly review intelligence. We regularly look at this. And Secretary Hagel, who you know is a very forceful, careful, deliberate person, signed the congressional notification saying he felt that Uruguay could substantially mitigate any threat by this detainee. <laughs> Um, again, we're happy to discuss this in a closed session. I would like I would like to do that in closed session. So we'll, we'll I'm sure we'll we'll make arrangements to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll we'll make arrangements to do that. Uh, at the same time, at the end of the day, the Uruguayans gave them the travel cards. Gave them the travel card to travel. At the end of the day, he walked right out of there, three times, and this time, nobody can locate him to get him back into custody. And he's, a, he's an Al-Qaeda-linked terrorist. Anyway, I'll, I'll go to Eliana ross Layton of Florida. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Royce, for calling this hearing and for continuing to demand transparency and accountability from the administration regarding its plans for Naval Station Guantanamo Bay and the detention center. As you point out, Mr. Chairman, the administration has not been forthcoming with the American people about the release of dangerous terrorists to various nations. The reality is that uh, uh, the situation is, is far different than what we've been told. So I continue to ask myself, why does a nation like Uruguay, why does a nation like Ghana, why does a nation like Senegal, and so many others, why would they want to take in these, uh, these dangerous uh, terrorists unless they believe that the benefits outweigh the risk, unless the administration convinced them that the benefits outweighed the risk. And not only that, but we're talking about a high-risk, high-threat individual, uh, and uh, that person has experience in evading authorities, will conduct operations, going to nations that have limited intelligence, uh, that do not possess the most sophisticated monitoring system that was obvious with the with the Uruguay transfer and we're to believe that the terrorists will not uh, use that to their advantage that they will be properly overseen it would probably take them just one day to realize how lax the security is in Uruguay for example so it's no surprise I think to any of us that that one of these individuals managed to flee Uruguay where uh, we now know that his movement was not required to be restricted um, to Brazil and from there, from who knows, as the chairman said, he may be en route to Syria or there already. 
So I would ask you, if it's possible, to get a, a yes or no answer. Has the administration promised any of these countries, whether it's Uruguay, Ghana, Senegal, whatever, cash for taking in these individuals? And if so, how much, how often, and to which countries? Um, Congresswoman, uh, uh, we, we have provided de minimis uh, resettlement assistance uh, to certain countries to support expenditures such as language training, um, vocational training, things of that sort. Uh, that is fully disclosed to the Congress in the congressional notifications uh, that you received. And if you could refresh my memory, for, for Uruguay, for example, how much uh, would, would that country have gotten for language and the other? I, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but we're happy to provide that information to you supplementally. And we'll get the notification, refresh my memory. Has the administration offered any other favorable agreements or offered to support these countries on, on other related matters in exchange, and if so, what, what kind of exchanges? Uh, nothing financial beyond what, what, what uh, is in the congressional notifications. Uh, anything related is, is a broad category. I, I can say generally in open session that many of our partners do view uh, a detainee transfer as an opportunity to deepen security and counterterrorism and intelligence cooperation with the United States. Uh, we generally welcome that, uh, and we look to facilitate uh, that interest where it exists. And has the administration provided military equipment or military training in exchange for taking in a detainee, and if so, to what extent and, and to which governments? No, oh, not to my knowledge, Paul. Ma'am, that's something we. Ma'am, that's something we'd have to talk about in a closed session. Like night vision goggles or something like that. Again, the negotiation of the security uh, assurances is very detailed and complex, and to discuss any specifics, I'd have to talk to you about that in a closed session. We're happy to do so. Has the administration provided intelligence equipment or training or promised or offered intelligence sharing uh, to any government in exchange for accepting a detainee, and if so, to what extent and which governments? Um, we would have to talk about intelligence matters in closed session. So it seems to me that the absence of, of any of, of these agreements wouldn't need to be discussed in a classified setting. So, I mean, unless you say no to these questions, I think it would be fair to assume that at least some of this has or has been happening, is happening. Um, is it the intent of the Obama administration to continue to release all but a handful of the most dangerous uh, detainees in order to then say to Congress, well, why keep Gitmo open when we have such few detainees there as if President Obama had not had anything to do with clearing out the uh, uh, the number of detainees in the first place? Uh, we intend to continue uh, essentially the policy of the previous administration to transfer detainees that we conclude may be safely and responsibly transferred outside the custody of the United States in accordance with applicable law. Would it be fair to say that from now until the end of the presidency, uh, this presidency, that we would be seeing more and more detainees being released, 5, 12, 2, and until there's just a handful and say, hey, look at all this wasted money for just a handful of folks, when you're the ones pushing them out. Uh, we have 29 detainees uh, who are proof of transfer, and our intention is to work to transfer those uh, individuals subject to security assurances. Thank you. Well, as you know, there's a great deal of resistance about having them come to the United States. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Eliana ross Layton, and we go to Mr. Brad Sherman of California. Okay. I'd like to comment on this over the next five minutes, and I'll probably offend uh, both political parties. The prior administration did release more uh, terrorists than the current administration. More of those released by the prior administration have been caught fighting us on the battlefield. 
the fact is, much as we like to fight as Democrats and Republicans, the policy has been the same in both administrations. House them only in Guantanamo because we don't have the political guts to house them here in the United States. And release as many as possible, far too many, far too quickly. And massively understate the costs of the release. We are told that it's wrong to keep them there for the duration of the war because the war has lasted too long. That is their fault. They waged war against America, and no, we never guaranteed them that the war would be short. The purpose of incarcerating POWs is not only to keep them off the battlefield, but to deter their comrades. When we tell the uh, terrorists around the world, if you get caught, you'll get released while the war is still going on, uh, we encourage their recruitment. Um, now, we're told that there are only 12 identified circumstances when Americans have died because of this release. That is such a massive undercount. First of all, when we release somebody and they rejoin the battlefield, do they send us a report? Are they listed on LinkedIn? New status, rejoin the terrorist movement? And then when one of these tw one American dies on the battlefield, do we get a report from the terrorists? Here's a list of the people who killed them. Here's a list of the people who provided them with logistics. Here are the people that provided the recruiting. Here are the people that provided the financing. So I would, unless we're, cer unless we're certain that one of these released people is being monitored every day and is not doing anything to help the terrorists, we have to assume that they are waging war against us as they did before. And uh, the cost of the... Uh, uh, the cost I, of, of release is also the incredible concessions Ileana Ross Layton brought this to attention. All the winks, all the nods, every country in the world, especially small countries, know. Take one detainee, the President of the United States is personally indebted to you. And when you've got a fishing concern, or if you're seeking something from the United States now or later, the answer is yes. We'll never get an accounting of that because you can't account for the winks and the nods. Now, we're told that Gitmo is a terrible, that we get a tremendous propaganda advantage if Gitmo is closed. Of course, we only partially closed it. We have no propaganda advantage. It's still a symbol the other side can use as long as it's open with one detainee. But we could bring these prisoners to the United States. That does not enhance their legal status. Uh, the Supreme Court has ruled uh, in the uh, uh, Brome Dion case and the Hamadan case, that they have just as many legal rights there as they would here. But we, here's an, an America where we accepted nuclear bases in our states, knowing that they were targets for the Soviet Union, and now we can't even accept a prisoner. And we whip up all this for Bureau. We got 443 convicted terrorists in American prisons not right now. I'll ask our witnesses to raise their hand if they're aware of any of those that escaped. I see no hands uh, going up. I'm not aware, and I've researched this. We've got Musawi. We've got Sakharov. We've got the shoe bomber, the underwear bomber, the World Trade Center 1993 bombers, the Oklahoma City bomber, and the Unabomber. And we're trying to bring to the United States El Chapo, who escaped Mexican prisons twice. We can incarcerate people here and obtain the uh, political advantage uh, that we're told uh, can be achieved by, uh, by uh, shutting down Gitmo. Uh, but instead, uh, we constantly vote on ways to not do it. If the legal rights of these POWs in the United States is too great, uh, if they're on U.S. soil, that's the fault of Congress. We can pass laws identifying that these are POWs. They're non-uniformed enemy combatants and entitled to less uh, uh, protection than those who, wore, who would wear uniforms fighting against us. So... Um, We've got a lot of dead Americans as a result of this catch and release program. We've got one party who says we can't house them here, although we're able to house terrorists here uh, in our prisons. And we've got a, another political party so anxious to shut things down that we massively understate the cost of releasing them. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Sherman. Mr. Issa of California. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd just like to 
bring us up to speed in one area. Uh, is it true that under current law, closing Guantanamo is prohibited? This isn't a trick question. <laughs> I, I, I don't think that current law prohibits closing Guantanamo. I think that what current law prohibits is the expenditure of money to move detainees uh, at Guantanamo into the United okay. States. Okay, so under current law, you can close Guantanamo by releasing the prisoners. You just can't bring them here. And that's your your assessment. Um, I believe the current law prohibits uh, detainees from being brought into the United okay, States. Okay, so the reason that you both have titles that say special envoy for Guantanamo closure is because your job is to close Guantanamo. Is that right? Uh, Sir, that is correct. Current, okay. Current, so, current, so let, now I just, that, that's, I got a yes, and I, that's far sir, enough. Sir, okay. my title is Guantanamo Detention Closure. We're not closing the naval facility. No, I understand that, uh, that the president who loves Chavez, and, or, or loves uh, uh, the uh, uh, Castros enough to, to open up relations has not decided to give back what we have in perpetuity. So we'll leave that aside. Your job is to close the detention. You are working toward that. I just want to ask one or two fairly simple questions. Dur it's been said many times on both sides of the dais that President George W. Bush's administration released more prisoners, actually, than you inherited, right? He released yes. more than you have. Yes. Okay. Um, and during that time, it has been discovered, and during this administration, it has been discovered and made public that, in fact, some released by the Bush administration went back and killed Americans on the battlefield in Afghanistan and other places. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So, George W. Bush released more prisoners, attempted to vet them, was wrong. They went back, they killed Americans on the battlefield, and we know it and the public knows it, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So George W. Bush's failures are now very public. They released people who went back and killed Americans on the battlefield. Okay, like Mr. Sherman, that's not necessarily popular with my party. This president has released many additional people who have returned to Afghanistan. Are you prepared to say that none of them killed Americans? Uh, you're talking about Guantanamo detainees Guantanamo returned to Afghanistan Guantanamo detainees released after 2009 who, in fact, went back and killed Americans. The assessment of the intelligence community is that no detainees released since 2009 during this administration are responsible for the deaths of Americans. So your public statement is that no detainees released by this administration have killed Americans on the battlefield as of today. Correct. Okay. I just want to make sure I have it on the record because I don't believe it. But you can say it, and I, you're under oath, and, and I believe it, that you believe it. Uh, so I just want to make sure we understand. We're sitting here, and somehow President George W. Bush, early on releasing the less dangerous, the, the easier to vet, the less likely to be a uh, hardened criminal uh, terrorist, terrorists, not criminals, they were released, they killed Americans. You're releasing people, they're not killing Americans. How do you account for that? Is this rehabilitation that you've done? Uh, sir, there, there are a lot of factual predicates embodied in your question that, that would require some correction. Well, the so President, first, President may, Bush released people, they killed Americans. You released people, they didn't kill Americans on the battlefield. How do you account for that difference that you've said under oath? Uh, as I indicated in, in, in my testimony submitted to the, for the record, we have put in place procedures that are comprehensive, they're rigorous, uh, they're interagency uh, in nature, and we believe that as a result of those procedures, uh, that has contributed to the very substantial reduction in the reengagement re rates seen uh, between both administrations. Okay, well, let, let's do that. You've, you've used procedures that have limited re-engagement, but it hasn't eliminated re-engagement, correct? That's correct. So you've released people after 2009. They have re-engaged. They're back on the battlefield attempting to kill Americans, right? Uh, 
It is not correct to say that anyone who has reengaged under the definitions used uh, by the intelligence community for confirmed or suspected reengagement is back on the battlefield. Again, I'm happy to talk, or better yet, the intelligence community can speak to the committee about the standards that are used, but it is an overstatement to say that an individual, for instance, who has been suspected of reengagement is on the battlefield seeking to do harm to coalition forces. Okay, but I, I just, you know, it's, it's just one of these things that I think in a very public, it's not, this is not something that needs to be privately discussed. It's something, now, Madam Chair, if I can have 30 more seconds, uh, my predecessors did. People that were released under Bush reengaged and killed Americans. You'll have us believe in a public state uh, environment that although people released under this administration were more hardened criminals, these were the people that were in fact, not released under Bush because he thought they were too dangerous. They've been released. You're saying in a public forum that they re-engage, but you're saying nobody died. Uh, sir, again, it's incorrect to assume that individuals released under Bush are less dangerous or more dangerous than released during this administration. Um, again, this would require a, a, a rather long discussion about why, for instance, the overwhelming preponderance of the detainees who are approved for transfer who are remaining in Guantanamo today are, for, are from Yemen. So it's just simply not correct to make uh, blanket assessments about who is more or who is less dangerous or, frankly, what the procedures you, you keep talking about vetting done by the Bush administration. Uh, again. Uh, we're not aware of the type of vetting that is done in this administration. So, again, there are a lot of premises embedded in your, in your question. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Issa. Mr. Duncan of South Carolina, I'm sure we'll follow through. You need some more time, gentlemen from California? 30 more seconds. Uh, you're well, you're your thank 30 you. seconds. Thank yes. you. I just want to understand, we have heard endlessly that the Bush administration released people and they went back on the battlefield and President George W. Bush and his administration have to live with the fact that they thought these people could be safely released back to Qatar and to other countries, and in some cases they were wrong, but you continue to work toward closure by release back to these countries, uh, Yemen being a, a particular area of concern, and I just want to make sure the American public hears in an open session that you believe that you've been flawless in that no Americans have died because of people released on this president's watch. And you've said that. So I want to thank the gentleman that was very kind to let me recap. Uh, thank you. And uh, thanks for your um, approach to everything, uh, Chairman Issa. Um, I first off want to apologize to the lady with the Department of State for coming across abrasive uh, about another issue. And I thank you for your help uh, on that other matter. Uh, we've established the fact that um, one of the Gitmo six uh, has, uh, Uruguayan six has disappeared. Um, we've also established the fact, I think, that um, there are certain requirements and parameters that must be met before detainees are transferred to a, a third country. Um, Uruguay told us, well, first off, Uruguayan law prevented intelligence monitoring and mitigation, and former President Mujica uh, said publicly that his government would place no restrictions on the movements of the six detainees that were released to Uruguay. Uh, later, we had their chief intelligence uh, officer probably informed the U.S. Embassy that these Uruguayan six, uh, the Gitmo six, would not be restricted in any way and that he was not authorized to conduct monitoring or surveillance. But if we go back to the requirements that have been talked about numerous times here this morning, surveillance and monitoring and, and uh, some assurances were part of the deal. So America needs to understand that one of the six detainees captured on the battlefield, Al-Qaeda operatives, captured either in Tora Bora, or Afghanistan, has disappeared. Uruguay, Brazil, United States, at this point, have no idea where this individual is. Now, this individual that uh, we're talking about, Jihad Diab, is a forger. He was responsible for forging documents, passports, travel documents for Al-Qaeda terrorists. He's now disappeared into Brazil. So let's take it to the 30,000-foot level and think about Brazil in general. 
we've got an area in Brazil and Paraguay known as the tri-border region. A lot of folks are transiting through Latin America through an area known as the tri-border region. They're coming to South America, to that area, oftentimes on fake passports, not necessarily forged passports. They're just passports that don't belong to them. And they're exchanging those documents in that region for other false documents and trying to transit through Latin America to get to America, to get to the United States. Case in point, five Syrians traveled to the tri-border region in Brazil on fake Israeli passports. The hypocrisy of that, I think, is alarming, that Syrians traveled to the tri-border region on fake Israeli passports, exchanged those documents for somewhere around $25,000 for fake Greek passports that they used to travel to Honduras, apprehended an airport in Honduras, trying to come to the United States on fake Greek passports. So now we have a Gitmo detainee forger for Al-Qaeda has escaped, disappeared, whatever you want to call it, into Brazil, possibly to the tri-border region to assist others from the battlefield, ISIS operatives possibly, coming to that area, exchanging documents, getting new forged documents or fake documents to possibly travel to the United States of America. But let's take it another step. There's a huge event getting ready to happen in Brazil, known as the Olympics. That's a heck of a terrorist target, folks. So we've got an Al-Qaeda operative who is a forger, who has escaped in Brazil or disappeared in Brazil, who has the ability to forge documents, and he's in a country that's getting ready to host the Olympics. I hope our counterterrorism efforts in Brazil, working with our allies there, are full bore. So I want to ask, now that this gentleman has escaped, he's gone missing, rather, is the Obama administration concerned about that? Um, sir, as I indicated previously, it, it was it would have been our preference that all six of the detainees transferred to Uruguay uh, stayed in You've Uruguay. You stated that. I ask you a question. Is the Obama administration concerned over uh, Jihad Diab's disappearance? Yes or no? Uh, as I said, I would have preferred that he stayed in Uruguay with the five other detainees through the end of the program, which was for another few months until December 2014. If you're asking me what concerns me, frankly, it is the 532 who were transferred during the previous Mr. administration uh, without the we, we, we have established the fact that we all wishes yeah. he wished he would have stayed in Uruguay and would be right there with the other five. What I'm asking you, is the Obama administration concerned that he has disappeared? I believe I've answered your question. Mr. Lewis. Sir, we're close to Okay. Sir. Knowing what you know now, will you publicly repudiate the Sloan letter about the Uruguayan uh, concerns um, so the Uruguayan government, who this administration tricked, I think, about these people, can finally begin monitoring and controlling the remaining five detainees. Will you repudiate the Sloan letter? Uh, we stand by the Sloan letter, uh, and we stand by uh, the representations that we made to the government of Uruguay at the time of the transfer. In fact, I believe that the Uruguayans told you, Congressman, when you visited, that they believed the United States had provided accurate information about each of the detainees transferred to their custody. They did, and that contradicted some previous statements they had made uh, publicly. So, um, so why do you think that is? I'm sorry? Why do you think that is? Well, we can go back through all of this. Well, I, I, why, why would they say one thing to you and another thing uh, privately? If, if um, Mr. Mr. Duncan, could you yield for a minute? I can. I, I did want to put something in perspective for our witnesses here, and it has to do with, with why the chairman of the Western Subcommittee would be upset here. And the fact is that the chief of intelligence in Uruguay explained to our committee, gave us the information that they were not allowed to monitor or surveil these six terrorists. And the decision you made was to transfer them anyway. He made that, he made that observation to this committee prior to the transfer. You made the decision to transfer these six, despite our warnings. The second point that is upsetting to him 
is that the intelligence chief was then dismissed from his position after warning us of that and subsequently warning us that they were casing or they were outside our embassy after their release and again that they were not allowed to monitor or surveil. Now we find ourselves in the, decision, in the situation despite Jeff Duncan's admonitions and concerns and despite what we brought up at the prior hearing, we find ourselves in the situation where one of these six indeed is one of these six terrorists is indeed been able to walk out of Uruguay and no one knows where he is but we do know his attitude and this is the reason for our concern but uh, I thank Mr. Duncan for his trips uh, and his work on behalf of the committee uh, I, and I want to thank the chairman for helping yeah. clarify that the, the pattern is clear we've been asking about these Gitmo 6 and about the, Par uh, the Uruguayans ability to monitor them for, for a, a long time now and we have raised concern about events such as what we've witnessed in the last 60 days where one of the six has just disappeared who was an al-Qaeda terrorist there's no doubt about it he was a forger and and we're supposed to tell these countries that these weren't terrorists that, that they weren't engaged in attacking or or or, or hurting our allies or our United States military in any way very clear that he was. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. We go to Mr. Um, Matt Salmon of Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last time you were here, Mr. Lewis, you testified that Americans have been killed, and I'm going to piggyback on Mr. Issa and Mr. Uh, Duncan's questions. Uh, you subsequently notified the committee that those deaths occurred in Afghanistan by as many as 14 former detainees, all who were released by the Bush administration. And I'd just like to ask a few questions about that. How many Americans were killed? Were they U.S. servicemen and women, civilians, or both? What are, what are their names and where are they from? Sir, it's our understanding that there are 14, and I can get you the specifics on that. We've, I believe we've, um, the intelligence community can get you those specific details, but the, the number is 14. Um, many of the incidents were in large-scale firefights in, in a war zone, so we can't always distinguish um, whether Americans were killed by former detainees or other participants. But um, the intelligence community can get you the specific details that you asked for, sir. Okay, and, and just to recap the specifics, I'd like to know whether they were servicemen or servicewomen or civilians or both, uh, and I'd like to know what their names are and where they're from. Those are the things I'd like. And you can provide or get, get me all of that. Yes, sir. That'll be very, very helpful. Um, and then uh, just to piggyback on some of the other questions, um, knowing that there were casualties associated with those detainees uh, to Afghanistan specifically, uh, you then, uh, as an administration, decided then it was okay to still release, release detainees to Afghanistan? Is that correct? Uh, it, may, it may have been correct um, uh, at the moment. Um, I can assure you that each detainee transfer to Afghanistan or, frankly, anywhere else uh, we is subject to the review of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, and I can tell you that the State Department would not concur in any transfer of a detainee to Afghanistan over the objection of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Well, did the – prior to releasing – detainees to Afghanistan, did the intelligence community assess that the government of Afghanistan was incapable of maintaining custody and control of these individuals? Um, the standard isn't maintaining custody and control because they're not transferred into custody. Uh, the standard is substantially mitigating uh, uh, the threat that they may pose. And again, these are determinations that would have been made uh, in conjunction with and subject to the consultation with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff if, in fact, uh, they occurred uh, in this administration. I believe that there, there have been. Yes, Congressman, there have been transfers to Afghanistan. And as uh, Anvai Woloski says, um, we do consult with the field commanders um, in Afghanistan prior to any transfer. And again, those transfers have been made under the statutory standard that any threat is going to be substantially mitigated by the host nation. 
So I, it's better to talk about this in a closed setting, sir. But, we, but we you did state for the record that one of your criteria uh, for uh, releasing them to Afghanistan was not monitoring. That's not a concern. You didn't care whether they were able to monitor or not. What we, we can't speak to specific security assurances with specific countries in an open session, but what I can say is that any transfer to Afghanistan uh, would have involved the consultation and concurrence of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, that's certainly what we do in all transfers, particularly in a place like, like Afghanistan. Uh, we at the State Department uh, currently would not consent to any transfer to a place like Afghanistan unless the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff concurs in the transfer. Well, Afghanistan is an active war zone, and it's also one of the most corrupt countries in the world. And so I, I guess what a lot of us would like to better understand is if monitoring isn't part of the decision uh, and making sure that uh, their whereabouts are, are, are readily ascertained, I guess our, uh, a lot of us wonder why that isn't one of the criteria. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Envoy Woloski, is that how you're saying that? Yes, sir. Okay. You said that the standard was not the elimination of risk, but a mitigation of risk in your earlier comments. Was that true under the prior administration as well? I don't believe so. So you all came in, the current administration came in with that in 2009, basically. Uh, actually, the Congress came in with that. It's written into the NDAA. It was a piece of legislation passed by the Congress and signed into law by President Obama. So that was the standard that you used. Um, that's pretty shocking, what Congressman Duncan revealed, that um, we were told that Uruguay was not going to be able to monitor uh, these guys' travel. There was six terrorists, and I'm not uh, knowledgeable or privy to who they were. These were not five, the five that was released in exchange for Bergdahl. Is that correct? Correct. Is it fair to say that or, or in the Bush administration, uh, didn't they attempt to try to release what was assessed to be the lower level risk combatants at first? I, I can't speak to it. I, I don't know what their process was. Is, is that fair to say in the current administration that you chose to release the lower risk first and held the, the, the worst to the last? Uh, the worst um, we're not releasing. Uh, we're only releasing uh, or transferring um, subject to security assurances those individuals who have been designated as approved for transfer by the six agencies and departments of the government that are responsible for those decisions. But common sense would probably dictate that the Bush administration followed those same guidelines. I don't think that that's a fair assumption, respectfully. One reason why um, it's not a fair assumption is uh, for years uh, we, we, we haven't released Yemeni detainees, who in many cases are low-level fighters, if that, uh, because of the circumstances in Yemen. So currently many of the detainees uh, who remain in Guantanamo and who are, who are approved for transfer are from Yemen. Uh, and that could reflect more their nationality than their yeah. risk profile. That goes to their risk profile, and I'm sure, too. Now, the five that were exchanged for Bergdahl, are they any of those back on the battlefield? Uh, no. I'm just going to defer to my colleague from the DOD to speak to that transfer because it was an anomalous transfer, as you know, negotiated by the Department of Defense as a prisoner exchange. Okay. I'm confident he will say no when he turns around. All right. Well, his time has passed. I'm going to move to the next question. Um, so there are countries who take who the administration negotiates with, and we have a disagreement about whether or not they actually will monitor them or not. What number of countries do we look at for, for transferring these combatants to? Is it 6, 8, 26? How many countries are involved? Um, we can get you the numbers, but I believe we've transferred detainees in this administration to, what, 30 or 40 countries? Uh, we've resettled to 30 and then nine uh, repatriations back to their own country. Okay, so 30 countries. 
Are you monitoring? Are you able to track? You talked about you, you earlier in your comments. You, you spoke with career government officials in making those assessments and those determinations. Career government officials on the United States side or on the prospective country side or both? Uh, I was referring to the U.S. side. U.S. side, okay. So on those 30 countries where we're sending people, whether or not they can monitor them effectively or not, or, and you said you're getting feedback. You, we called it, uh, I think it was information sharing. Is that in real time? It can be. It can be, but is it? Uh, in some circumstances that I'm aware of, it is in basically what, real time. Was it in real time on the guy from Uruguay that got loose? Uh, we can discuss that in closed session. I would welcome the opportunity to do that today if okay. you would like to, uh, okay. sir. Of those 30 countries, are you able to track in real time and even in, in, in uh, retrospect, are you able to track and say, okay, this country did a good job of keeping up with their combatants, this country didn't, this country was okay, this country was lousy. Is there a scale of rating those countries and their abilities? I'm not aware of a scale. Uh, we certainly in the case. So how do you know going forward in the future if a country doesn't do a good job? How do you say, well, we'll give that country another one or two or three? How do you determine that? By their record. Well, that would be a scale, wouldn't it? Uh, I don't think so. It would be specific to the performance of a particular country. Their monitoring, uh, their information sharing with the United States. If we're not satisfied uh, with uh, with the results on a previous transfer, we wouldn't transfer a new one to that same place. Okay, well that makes sense. And then uh, of, of, of the discussion you had with uh, Mr. Duncan and Mr. Issa, uh, you talked about the those released under the previous administration, Bush, and there was 530, I think, released. And, and how many is under the current administration? 159. 159. So uh, I don't think that you and Issa agreed on the fact that somehow Bush released uh, the good ones and Obama released the bad ones. Is that a fair statement? That's correct. Okay. Would you say they were roughly equal? Uh, it's impossible to generalize. Each case is different. Well, well, that All lack I was of... trying to do was to push back against the suggestion that Bush released the easy ones and we only have the hard ones. Right, but it's safe not to a, say without not an accurate characterization. Well, without the specifics, you can't accurately know that. But in general, one a reasonable person might make that kind of assumption. Uh, we are all about talking about specifics, not okay. generalizations. That's Fair why we're here. It's why we have requested the opportunity okay. to speak with you in closed session, because frankly, a lot is w of what is said. Okay. Well, I, I'm running out of time. about I'm Uruguay out. is just inaccurate. Okay, we'll come. And I'm, I'm happy to, t to tell you if you're interested let in learning the facts about why some of what was cut, said. We'll come back to that, Mr. Woloski. Accurate, I'm Mr. Woloski, I'm, I'm out of time. Speak to it. Mr. Woloski, I'm out of time. Yeah, this is not a uh, – let me just say thank, thank you for being forthright, but we are on a time limit. Sir, Two sir, quick can questions. I make, can I make one comment, though? Uh, yes, sir, sir, you may. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are 29 detainees that are currently eligible for transfer who we believe we can transfer safely and responsibly if we get security assurances. That can I make a suggestion? Yes, sir. Don't send them to Uruguay. <laughs> Sir, many of them are Yemenis. That's why they're there. If Mr. Woloski, back to you. At the, Thank you, sir. You, you're welcome. At the end of the Uruguay program, you mentioned earlier that the guy got free Where two months. Your last question. Right, two months early. Tell, for the committee's sake, what would an additional two months done, in your opinion? Would it have rehabilitated that combatant? What would that have done? This, com this individual, Diab, frankly, was a problem from the moment he landed in Uruguay, and I'll tell you that and be upfront about it. His resettlement was difficult. Uh, he did not seem to want to participate in the opportunities that were being afforded to him by the government. Should we have had snapback sanctions in place, to use another term bannered around? Uh, we, are, we are not uh, repopulating Guantanamo. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. We go to Mr. Joe Wilson of South Carolina. Thank you, Chairman Royce, and thank you for your leadership on this issue, and, and it's so important. I've had the opportunity to visit Guantanamo twice uh, to see the uh, personnel there, uh, the uh, professionalism uh, of our military, uh, and, and it's the place where terrorists should be. Uh, in my home state of South Carolina, we've learned a lesson. There's one terrorist at the Navy Brig in Charleston. Uh, he's had a consequence. He's attracted more terrorists to come to the community and, and threaten 
uh, attacks on the facility, um, putting schools at risk, um, neighborhoods in the immediate uh, neighborhood at risk. Uh, it, it's utterly absurd, uh, the thought of bringing them to the United States uh, in any way or releasing them. Uh, and uh, it's interesting you say Yemen. Uh, you release people to Yemen, uh, which was supposed to be an example of uh, great success uh, by this administration of establishing a, a stable country. Uh, and within days of releasing and pardoning uh, terrorists, uh, the country collapsed. Uh, and it would be interesting to know what, what did happen to the uh, persons who had been released to Yemen previously. Uh, we do not release individuals to Yemen. Well, you had previously uh, released uh, before the collapse of the country. But there is a consistency here which is not good. And the consistency is we have an administration that's dismissed, uh, dismissed ISIS as a JV, junior varsity. Uh, these are the same people after the announcement of junior varsity uh, that committed mass murder in Jakarta, in Brussels, in Paris, in Orlando, in San Bernardino. Uh, we know the mass murder uh, this week uh, in Baghdad and in Kabul. Uh, over and over again, there's been a, a dismissal of uh, threats to the American families. Additionally, uh, it's incredible, too, uh, this administration is very consistent uh, by reaching a dangerous Iranian nuclear deal, providing tens of billions of dollars uh, to a state sponsor of terrorism. Just last week, uh, the funding that uh, has been provided by Iran to Hamas, there have been rocket attacks on Sederat in Israel. Again, uh, it's, it's extraordinary to uh, ignore this. And then we come to uh, pardoning and returning uh, terrorists to go back on the battlefield. Uh, this is inconceivable. And, and it's also quite, quite illogical. As you talk about a recruiting tool, uh, a recruiting tool is releasing people, not being serious about uh, detaining people who have every intent to kill American families. Uh, and uh, it, it's really interesting to me that they don't use uh, the argument uh, that it's a uh, deterrent or it's a recruiting tool to have prisons within the United States. Of course it's a deterrent. Uh, if people know they're going to be incarcerated, uh, they're less likely to commit a crime or kill American families. Uh, and I'm really grateful that uh, even CNN yesterday uh, reported that uh, U.S. officials have said that 44-year-old uh, Abu Wael Dayab, a Syrian national, went off the radar several weeks ago in Uruguay where he was resettled in 2014, not 2000. Uh, prior to 2009. Uh, and so Uruguay's interior minister told CNN that Dayab was considered a refugee by the government and as such he would not need permission from Uruguayan authorities to leave the country. They said he would only need permission from the foreign country he wished to enter per an agreement with the U.S. that enabled the release of Gitmo detainees to Uruguay. And there's a truth uh, from CNN that I, I hope you look at and will reconsider what you're doing. And that is that the disappearance could provide fuel for opponents of efforts to close the detention facility at Guantanamo, especially if Diab is found to be attempting to join a terrorist group. Of the 676 detainees released from the detention facility as of January, 118 have returned to the fight. An additional 86 are suspected of returning, a recidivism rate of nearly one out of three released, according to a recent report from the administration's Office of Director of National Intelligence. Um, by releasing, pardoning these people, uh, American families are at risk around the world. And I, uh, I just hope that you will uh, reconsider what you're doing. And then uh, I'm really grateful in the Washington Post, Gordon England, the former Secretary of the Navy, and he's an extraordinary public uh, servant. He's a person of the highest integrity. Uh, he has warned that the process of uh, releasing the early process um, did work, but that what's being done is that uh, there were 200 detainees uh, when he departed. None have been approved for release. Under the, the president, more than half have been released. None of the low risk, according to vigorous vetting, he has conducted during the Bush administration. Statements by the contrary of the White House are misleading at best. And so I, I hope you will really reconsider and understand that we're in a global war on terrorism. Uh, this is not an academic uh, exercise of deterrence or incarceration, and I yield my time. Okay, we go to Mr. Dana Rohrbacher of California. Uh, thank you. Uh, do any of you, uh, do either of you or know of cases, uh, do you believe that 
Americans at Gitmo were involved uh, with criminal mistreatment of the detainees? I'm not aware of that. Okay. So, uh, but the President has made it a national security imperative that we close Gitmo. And this, uh, we are told that he has to close Gitmo because it's got such a bad reputation. But yet, from what you just said, we know that those charges are not true. Is that right? Um, the so we, have, we, have, we have a propaganda campaign going on by the enemies of the United States, detractors of the United States, against us, claiming that there was uh, some kind of uh, major uh, uh, criminal mistreatment of prisoners in Guantanamo. And uh, neither one of you knows an example of that, or the fact is if there was one or two instances, it certainly didn't reflect what was going on in Guantanamo. Correct? Sir, the, the, the issue is wrongfully so. There are many people around the world and many countries who think that there were things that went wrong at Gitmo. We don't right. believe that they were, but they, well, it's not they, only they, they perceive well, that let, it happened. Well, let me correct it. Not only did some people, a lot of people think that, but there are people who hate our country who are promoting that knowing it's not true. Let's get this in, in your mind. This isn't nice American politics. This isn't a criminal matter, although the president would like to think of these terrorists as being American criminals, Americans who made a criminal act. This is people who hate our way of life. They're engaged in an organized effort to terrorize Western civilization by murdering large numbers of non-combatants. Sir, many this of is what we're trying to do. We, we're trying to handle this. And what we get is a president who makes a national security imperative to give in to those people who propagandize, and by doing that, adds some sort of credibility to whom? To the charge that our people who are working in Guantanamo are a bunch of ghouls who are torturing these people. I totally thought, yeah, th there may be a, one or two instances where somebody lost their temper or did something wrong. But by and large, you know and we know that the prisoners in Guantanamo have been treated extraordinarily well. The president, by making it a national security imperative, has basically demonstrated that the propagandists by people who hate us will succeed, and it will be seen and is seen as a sign of weakness by terrorists all over the world. This very act that we're talking about is encouraging those people who will murder non-combatants, especially Americans. Let's get back to the number 532 released by Bush. Now, among those, I know were some, for example, a lot of people were picked up. Uh, they, the Uyghurs from uh, Afghanistan had been picked up. They were in Afghanistan at the time of our operations. There were a lot of situations like that. Uh, Obama has released uh, 159. I think it is a bit disconcerting. Again, when this administration insists on treating these terrorists and those involved in terrorist activities as nothing more than criminals. You know, they are nothing more than like criminals would be in the United States. Uh, that's why perhaps the president finds it impossible to say the words radical Islamic terrorist, because that is different than just some criminal who's committed an act of violence or murder in the United States. And by doing so, again, seen as a, as a weakness, the president is actually encouraging terrorists around the world to take advantage of this weakness, take advantage of the fact we're willing to retreat if you just have a propaganda campaign. Uh, I'm glad to hear that we actually are uh, suggesting that our guys didn't commit uh, all sorts of horrible acts against these people. But of the 159 that were released, that have been released. What is disconcerting is when I hear, that, well, we don't have proof and we, it's been determined that this number of, of people have, uh, have not, these people actually haven't committed any of these other acts after they've been released. I, like Mr. Isa, find that totally, uh, it is absurd, it's so bad. The fact is that uh, we, uh, 
if we're waiting for evidence to prove before we can say, well, we think it's probable that they have been involved because we know what kind of people they are, that's one thing. But what we're being told is, unless we have overwhelming evidence that they've killed Americans or killed other innocent people, we are going to assume that they haven't. Well, this is a way, this is not watching out for the security interests of the people of the United States. This is projecting weakness. This is going to make sure that more Americans die if by nothing else uh, giving in and, and having a president of the United States insisting on treating terrorists as if they're American criminals, which will do nothing but encourage terrorism overseas. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chairman. gentlemen. We, we go to Mike McCall, uh, Chairman of the Homeland Security Committee. Mike McCall of Texas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, the President campaigned on a promise to close Guantanamo. Uh, is it fair to say that that campaign promise will not be fulfilled? It's difficult to say. Uh, as you know, we're asking the Congress to reconsider its position on bringing a small number of detainees into the United States where, as you know, our federal, as you know better than most, uh, Congressman, our federal prison system has a 100 percent success rate in safely uh, 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 incarcerating over 400 convicted terrorists. So, but the current plan is to process 29 transfers out of Gitmo, which would leave, I think there are 79 detainees that would leave uh, 50, I guess, at Guantanamo, right? That's correct. Uh, you know, the, there are 10 that are in some uh, phase of the military commission process and are being prosecuted or serving sentences. Uh, the periodic review board process is ongoing, so it's possible that the number of detainees who are approved for transfer will, um, will increase. Uh, but your, your round numbers are generally correct. And that, it, it might have been down there. I saw Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, evil incarnate. Um, so the 50 remaining, it, it, is it your intention to, we passed in the Congress under the National Defense Authorization Bill an express prohibition uh, against bringing these uh, detainees into the United States. Uh, this administration will honor that uh, legal restraint, correct? It will follow the law. As the President has said, uh, his intention right now, his goal, is to work with the Congress to change the law. Okay. Um, what is the status of the trial of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed? It's in the motions phase, sir. Why is this taking so long? I was a federal prosecutor. This has been, you know, since 9-11. Sir, I'm a former federal prosecutor as well. Um, other people are better. Um, place to answer your question, but broadly what I'll tell you is it's a, it's a new process, so everything is new. There's no precedent. Um, there are a bunch of very good defense counsels, um, and the judge is being careful and deliberative. Uh, we have a very good chief prosecutor, General Martins, who's, who's trying very hard, but it's just um, you know, the law, to do the law carefully, as you know, sir, um, is a careful right. and process. Right, I know, I know defense counsel following a lot of motions. Pretty nice courtroom down there. There are 50 detainees that will, that will be left. How many of those will be facing military trials? Right now, as Envoy Woloski said, there are, there are seven that are in the motions phase, the 9-11-5, um, the coal bomber, the alleged coal bomber, and then um, one more al-Qaeda uh, leader. There are three in the sentencing phase, and we're continually looking at the others to see if there can be a case, but I, uh, I'm not best placed to tell you um, okay. where we'd be. Getting back to those who you plan to release, we know 13 released have been implicated in attacks against the United States or coalition forces in Afghanistan. Uh, not a good number. Um, let me ask you this question. Has the administration ever refused to send detainees to a country because it could not provide adequate security? Absolutely. Uh, there are many countries that we look at uh, that we ultimately determine um, uh, are not suitable for this. And you mentioned a lot of these um, detainees you want to transfer out are Yemenis. Uh, Yemen is a failed state in my judgment, and it's, it's in a uh, 
really bad state of affairs. You have the uh, Houthis down there, Iranian forces. You have al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula still plotting external operations against the United States. Um, can you tell me definitively that you will not be sending these det detainees to Yemen? Yes. Okay. That's a, a very good answer. What country would most likely receive them? Um, I, I prefer to talk to you in closed session about that. I mean, what I, what I will say, as you know, generally we prefer repatriations to resettlements because of cultural affinities, language, skills, uh, family connections. Um, in this case, you know, that's not going to be possible for Yemen, so we are – uh, we're looking at other alternatives. Well, last question. The Saudis have a pretty good de-radicalization program. Have you considered that? Uh, yes. In fact, we transferred a number of Yemenis, I believe nine, to Saudi Arabia in April. Okay. I see my time's expired. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to get back to the issue of what you told this committee in March, just in closing here. We asked specific questions about the transfer of detainees to countries ill-equipped to handle them. And specifically, we asked whether the Department of Defense ever transferred a detainee to a country that it knew was incapable of, incapable of maintaining control of that individual and keeping him from, retain, from returning to the battlefield. And Mr. Lewis responded no, and Mr. Wolowski stated that he was not aware of such an instance. Your written response to the committee's letter, though, sent just this week, states that the law doesn't prohibit us from sending detainees to countries that have partially derogatory intelligence assessments. Now, partially derogatory, in common terms, means can't contain, or at least are seriously challenged in containing those terrorists. So why didn't you cite the law instead of suggesting to the committee that detainees were not being transferred to countries that were incapable of maintaining control of them when it is so clear that they are? That's, that's the point I wanted to make. That's why this seemed to me like misleading the committee. And while I appreciate the witness's willingness to speak to us in a classified set, setting, which we'll take advantage of, that can't hide the fact that these issues can and have been discussed very productively here today. As you can see, we have serious concerns about this policy and we'll continue the conversation. But I do want to thank the witnesses and thank the members of the committee. And um, the committee is adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.